what I want to focus on is opportunities where we can just make a community a little bit better. I don't want to displace residents. I want to give them a better home that fits the current market conditions. You're listening to the Real Returns podcast, where we learn how real investments can make a real impact. Join your hosts, Andrew and Dan, as they share stories and interview business leaders on how real estate and other forms of investment can create meaningful change for individuals and communities around the world. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Real Returns podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Reichert. I've got with me, Dan, the man, Croce. Dan, what's happening over there today? Andrew, gotta be honest, a little down in the dumps today. Usually, oh, usually excited for this podcast. I mean, I'm excited to talk to John Kasman, but aside from that, I'm gonna be vulnerable with you, okay? I was, I was having a heart to heart with my wife this morning, and we were just talking about life and reflecting, like we do on this podcast sometimes. And uh, I was just telling her to like embrace her mistakes. Yeah, you know, like sometimes you just gotta embrace, mm, good advice, yeah. just embrace your mistakes. So she gives me a hug. And I'm like, oh, because I'm one of her mistakes, right? So then, so then, then what happens is <laughs> embrace your mistakes. That's good. <laughs> so we're still having this heart to heart, right? And I'm like, I, I just get into a little personal here, but I'm like, you know, I just have to know, am I the only one you've ever been with? And you know what mm-hmm. she says to me? What she says? She says, yes. All the others were nines and tens, but but you're the only one I've ever been with. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, Dan, I would at least call you a four or a five. I mean, that's that's pretty rough for the white to call you a one. Oh, uh, boy. That's anyway, too funny. <laughs> went the went the dirty road, dirty joke route today. So my apologies. Hopefully, our listeners forgive me. But that's only slightly dirty. Yeah. Just hey, on a more serious note, we are delighted to be joined today by John Kasman. John is a real estate entrepreneur who partners with busy professionals to acquire. Uh, multifamily real estate assets. He's acquired over $100 million worth of apartments to date. John is also uh, a consultant for multifamily investors. He hosts the Multifamily Insights podcast, which I believe has over 600 episodes, tons of amazing content there. And he created the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit as a way to connect people out there in the industry. Before being in the real estate space, John was a professional marketer. He led campaigns for big brands like General Motors, Nike, and Coors Light. So really excited to have John on the show today. John, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, Andrew, Dan, thank you guys for having me. Excited to be here. I am not the only one my wife has been with. So, uh, you know, to give you a, a, a little bit about me, as you mentioned, backgrounds in advertising and marketing, I, I did what, you know, they tell you to do, right? You go to college, you get decent grades, you get a good job and, you know, you launch into your career, you do that until you retire. So that was the plan. But one of the things that happened to me very early in my career is I saw what happens when companies have other plans for you or for their staff. So I was at GM back in 2007, 2008, 2009, when the company went through bankruptcy. So I realized, you know what, I need to start create my own capital. I need to create passive income. I need to have a plan B. And that led me to start investing in real estate. Well, fast forward, and I'm working at this advertising agency. At this point, I bought a few properties, two unit, three unit. I just bought an eight unit building. So my very first commercial property, I'm on the track. This is working well. And the company I'm working for ends up going into bankruptcy. So by this point, I've got my two little kids. I just put all the equity I had, all the savings I had into this property and my company is shutting its doors. So I panic. (laughs) Once I stopped panicking, I realized that my strategy was right, but some of the tactics I was taking were wrong. So I stepped back, you know, really learned how to approach the business the right way, learned this thing about, you know, OPM, other people's money, raising capital for deals. And I started to go down that route, working with other investors. And to date, we've helped others invest alongside us in over $125 million worth of apartments. Amazing. Yeah, it's really an incredible background. And the thing that I love is the approach that you take, not just for your own benefit, but helping others. I mean, you just said that you, you allow others to come into what you're doing. How do you think of your platform for helping others? Like, what does it look like to come alongside somebody else that's trying to raise capital for a deal or even just trying to understand this space, like through, through what you're doing on the podcast. 
Yeah, I mean, there are two ways we help people, right? So one is through kind of our education platforms, teaching people how to do what we do, how it works, what to look out for, those kind of things. So we built up kind of our one-on-one coaching platform there. On the flip side of that and where we started was just really helping people invest alongside of us, getting that passive income and learning how to invest in real estate without the hassles of being the landlord or a flipper themselves. And what I've found is most people have heard that real estate investing can be a great investment, right? I don't, I don't think there's much debate around that. That doesn't mean everybody wants to run out and be a real estate investor, right? Some people realize mm-hmm. that, hey, it's risky. You could lose your money. You can make a mistake. You don't want to deal with contractors. You don't want to deal with tenants. So there are definitely you know, hurdles that people see. And some folks are willing to jump over those hurdles. Some folks are going to use those ob- obstacles to stop them from getting started. The challenge that I see is that all of us want financial freedom. You know, we want more time, flexibility. We want to generate wealth. We want more time with our family. You know, even if they think we're one, you know, we want to, <laughs> we want to be around these people, right? And the path to doing that really comes down to creating passive income. And if we know that, whether it's, you know, through deep strategy or deep reflection or just intuitively, well, what are those things that are holding us back? And a lot of times, It's the education, it's the knowledge, it's the resources, it's the connections to invest. And it doesn't have to be real estate. But for me, I looked around and said, all right, well, I'm I'm likely not going to invest in the the next, you know, tech widget that's going to, you know, make us multimillionaires. I'm not going to learn the stock market. It was just confusing to me. I get stocks, I get companies, but, you know, trade now, sell now, that like, that seemed too active and way too complex to, to be my, my approach, right? Real estate at its core is pretty simple, right? It, it's a building, it's a property, you invest for cash flow, and if you hold it long enough, it tends to go up in value. So at its core, it's third grade math. We can make it really complex and, and make it challenging, but at its core, there's always gonna be a need for real estate. So I felt, for me at least, that removed some of that additional risk. And there were plenty of people who had made fortunes in real estate that did not have college degrees, that did not work for large corporations, that did not oversee $100 million budgets and oversee you know, five to 10 different agency partners. So I felt like if these individuals could get into real estate and make it work for them, I could too. Yeah. Well, I love that perspective because to your point, there's a ton of people that have done this over time and there's a lot of precedent for how to do it. And yet I find, and I think this is really why the education piece is important. I find so few people know exactly where to get started. Like you said, it's third grade math. It's not rocket science. And yet there are so many people that just don't know how to get started. So, so what do you find is the biggest education gap? Like when you're talking to folks, is it raising the capital for their first deal? Is it sourcing their first deal? Like what is it that you find is the big education gap? Well, I think there's two things, right? The industry can be intimidating, especially if you're talking about commercial real estate. Now, if you're if you're buying a house to flip, maybe that, you know, is is more inviting. But you guys know commercial real estate, you know, brokers are, you know, they got a ton of questions. They're gonna speak in their jargon. And if you don't know the language in the passcode, right, you're gonna fail their test mm-hmm. and they're not gonna send you any deals. So I think the first thing for me is, you know, I'm a guy who went to a state college, I'm very intelligent, but the way my intelligence works is I have to really, really understand something so I can regurgitate it in simple terms. So I don't do the regurgitation of information, right? I'm not going to sit out here and throw a, a bunch of terms and try to confuse people and make it sound like I know all this extra stuff. People talk about the yield curve inverting and all this other stuff. It's like, listen, it's great. I know it's all important, right? But once you understand it, we got to strip some of that stuff away. But it intimidates a new investor. If you're a new investor and you're trying to learn how to invest and you're hearing people talk about the yield curve reverting, you're hearing them talk about cap rates and you talk about bonus depreciation and reversion and all this other stuff, it can be overwhelming because you feel like you don't have enough knowledge to invest. So for me, what helped me get started and what helps a lot of other people is simply aligning yourself with the person who has that knowledge, right? Instead of you feeling like you need to go get a master's degree in commercial real estate information, partner with a group like ours or a group like yours where you already have that knowledge of how to do it, right? How to find it, what to look for, what to pay attention to, what to ignore. You can partner there. You can partner with, as a JV, you can partner as an LP in a syndication deal, right? You can hire a coach or a mentor, consultant. 
get somebody that can help educate you in that space. So I think that knowledge and that confidence is the first thing. Now, if you are looking to raise capital for a deal, you know, whether it be a, a deal you found by yourself or you're looking to partner with someone else, again, I go back to that knowledge and the confidence there. But the other thing that's really difficult is people don't know how to protect those around them. So it's one thing to raise capital for a deal, but for me, I'm raising capital from people I know, you know, my friends, my family, my loved ones. I want to make sure I'm doing everything possible to protect them. Most people who, you know, are, are worth investing in, they want to protect those investors, right? Very few people want to come out there and say, oh, I don't care if you lose your money, like I'm going to make mine, right? Most of us yeah. see the long-term value in doing good deals, doing right by people, helping other people succeed. So we want to invest in ourselves so that we can protect those individuals. So if you don't have that knowledge yourself, you have to align yourself with people who can help guide you through that process, learn from their mistakes, and help you navigate this world of commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, a couple of things I heard, one of the guys I follow, his name's Dan Sullivan, he talks about who, not how. Yep. So instead of trying to figure out the how, align yourself with the who. And I think so many people try to figure out the how on their own. That was something I had done. Uh, yeah, let me just read every book and figure it all out on my own and make all the mistakes when when really you could you could take the shortcut to just align yourself with the right who. I, I think that's super powerful. I also love how you think of working with investors, both on the active and the passive side. So there's not a one size fits all investment strategy. You know, the active investor might want to go out and really figure it out, whereas the passive investor might want to hire somebody to figure it out or, you know, really just get the mailbox money, so to speak. Can you talk a little bit about how you think of impact among various stakeholders? So I think I understand the investor side. You're having impact there on education and, you know, helping with syndications and capitalization. Can you talk about maybe the residents or the communities or, you know, what are some of the other stakeholders you think about in terms of impact? Yeah, I love that. That's a great question, right? When you think about impact, it's not just our investors, it's an entire community. I mean, you think about it, one, one property you buy could be 100 units, 200 units, whatever it is. Let's just say it's a 200 unit community you purchase. Well, that's 200 units, right? That's 200 residents, typically with families, right? So this could be 300 or even 400 people that you're housing. These are employees, right? You might have a staff of five to 10 people who are earning their salaries here. You have brokers, agents, and, you know, attorneys, lenders. You have an entire ecosystem that is making money, that is taking care of their family. You're providing housing, you're, you're driving the economy. So there's a strong impact when it comes to real estate investing. And the reason I, I want to bring that out is there is a, a feel-good component of making impact, but there's also a, a very true economic component, right? If you want to do good and feel good and make money, that's awesome. And most of us want to do that. If you just care about the money, that's great too. And let me tell you why this is important. Many people know that real estate investing is one of the best ways to reduce your tax liability. What they don't understand is why and why the government, why the IRS incentivizes real estate investors as opposed to W-2 employees. And the reason is what I just talked about. We're providing quality housing. We're providing jobs. We're stimulating the economy. When we invest in these properties, a lot of people get paid. Lots of people get their fees. We employ different employees from the property management company, our contractors, small business owners, and we're providing quality housing. We've seen what government housing looks like. It's not that good, right? So <laughs> you want the private market to go out there and identify opportunities to renovate these units and bring them up to current market conditions that people want. That's what we get incentivized for, right? So we're out there, we're taking all this risk, we're investing in these communities, we're making it a better place to live, we're making it a more viable place to live, and that helps everyone. So there's definitely big impact there from being able to invest in these communities. Now, as an investor, you can go above and beyond that. You can have proceeds that go to certain causes or things like that, but even at its core, as real estate investors, there's a big impact you have. John, I think that's such a great point. You know, I don't know that I've ever actually heard someone articulate that that way, but I think I think the industry gets a bad rap as, you know, being who being people who try to find loopholes and kind of try to not pay their fair share. But I think it's a great point that there's a reason that the government 
incentivizes us to prioritize, you know, putting capital in our own communities to raise the standard of living for everyone. So love that. It's a great point. Hey, can you tell us a little bit on the Casman Capital side of things? What do you guys do? I know you invest in, cool. in apartments, but where, what kind of apartments? And yeah, just what's a little bit of the story of, of that business? Yeah, so Casman Capital invests in value-add apartments. And all that means is we like to find communities where we believe we can bring more value to both the resident base that lives in that community, as well as us as investors. We like what we call B-class properties. And the way I define that, just to keep it simple, is it's not the high-end luxury stuff, right? We're not going after, you know, the beautiful gold faucets and that kind of stuff. But we're also not going down to the lowest common denominator. We're not investing in really rough areas. We're also not gentrifying communities. And I think this is a very important point. Sometimes when you talk about investors getting a bad rap, well, there are people who don't care about the people who live there, right? They want to come in renovated drive rents up a thousand percent make their money and they're out we don't want to do that i actually never want to do that what i want to focus on is opportunities where we can just make a community a little bit better i don't want to displace residents i want to give them a better home that fits the current market conditions so because of that we're not investing in some of the rougher areas because there's a different business play there now if you were to invest in that that's fine but I would just say, you know, you'd want to go in there with a mindset of, well, how can we make this better? Not necessarily just displacing the current residents of that community. So that's our approach is, you know, we don't want to kick everybody out and, and change the entire demographic. It's more about, hey, you know what? This property was built 30, 40 years ago. Kitchens have all been dated. There's not a whole lot of newer type stuff in the area that's affordable. Why do we make something that's a little bit nicer, more current, more modern? that these residents can appreciate. And yes, they're going to be willing to pay a little bit more of a premium to live in these units that are updated. John, I really appreciate how you've identified your target market and kind of your your niche right there. Class B, you know, multifamily apartments, super clear in terms of the profile of asset you're trying to buy. One thing I'd be curious about, did, did you sort of find your way into that over time from having made some mistakes in other asset classes? And I guess a follow on to that is, well, what do you feel like is maybe some of the common pitfalls that you find from folks who are just getting started investing in apartments? That's a great question. So for us, we did try to invest in different asset classes. I think there's two things, right? You want to make sure that you can deliver on that investment thesis. I think sometimes, and part of the reason those investors get a bad rap when they're investing in, say, C-class or D-class type properties is they don't have the resources or the infrastructure in place to do it the right way. So mm -hmm. they're cutting corners. They're trying to save costs, right? So things break more frequently or residents aren't happy with the results. So it ends up being this situation where everything is really tied to cost and returns, and you can't really create that, that environment you're looking for. Now, there are definitely ways of doing that. There's affordable housing programs. There's you know different incentive packages out there where you can create that environment. But for a lot of people, that's the approach and it ends up being something where they can't invest in a community the way they want to because the numbers just don't work out. On the flip side of that, with the class A stuff, I feel like you're always competing with the next newest, hottest thing. And those residents have so many options available that it really becomes an amenities race where you're trying to get the newest, latest, greatest thing. You're competing with the guy building a brand new property, you know, next door. And that's just not an area where we have a ton of value you know you could do it but we're not uniquely positioned to outdo our competition in that market right yeah. but in this b class space we just think it's a sweet spot it's affordable it's workforce meaning that these are your policemen these are your firefighters these are your teachers these are your post office workers these are people who have good regular jobs you know the heartbeat of america but maybe they can't buy a home maybe they can't afford to buy a home or they're saving for a home or they want to be somewhat flexible for whatever reason so they choose to rent for these reasons, right? We're not necessarily talking about people who are on vouchers. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not necessarily our core demographic. So we like providing housing for these individuals. We like the properties that we can invest in. We like being able to, you know, have a, a quality agreement where they know what their rent is. They're, they're willing to pay their rent. We're not beating them up. We're not making threats about evictions and that kind of stuff. It's just, hey, you know, they came here because they wanted the quality housing. They're willing to pay it. 
and we can provide that. So it's a two-way street where we kind of hold each other accountable. If they have an issue, we want to address it. I want them to have a great experience living at one of our properties. So that's something I think is key to our fundamentals. You know, I remember we had a, a C-class property, one of the first larger deals that I, that I did, and it was challenging because mm-hmm. we felt like every time we would take a step forward, we'd take two back. You know, we'd have residents who would complain about this or we'd fix up a unit and, you know, a neighbor would want their unit fixed up, but they weren't willing to pay the additional money <laughs> that it would take us to, to fix that unit, right? So we just felt, quite frankly, that we couldn't deliver the experience at that level that they needed, that they wanted. And it wasn't really our sweet spot. So I think you just have to be honest as an investor to know what you do well. There's some folks who are great at that, you know, and if you can, you have no problem going on in those neighborhoods and knocking on doors and collecting rent, more kudos to you, right? But that's just not the thing that made me feel good. It it never feels good to press somebody for 25 bucks, right? And you might say, oh, it's only 25 bucks. Listen, I grew up where $25 was a lot of money. So (laughs) it's still $25 to somebody. And if you don't feel like that's an equitable exchange, then you should probably rethink your strategy. For us, I would rather be in communities where people are happy to pay that $25 extra because they feel like they're getting more value in exchange for that than in an area where this might be the difference between, you know, a lifestyle choice or someone going to a camp or this is changing what the dinner is going to look like. You know what I mean? Like, that doesn't make me feel good as an investor. So I'd rather be in areas where people can afford it, they want to pay for it. It's a great value exchange. And we feel like we're adding value to that community. Wow, I love that because the way that you've defined your target market and identified that is really based on the impact that you're having. You've really zeroed in on a market that you feel like is uniquely positioned to allow you based on your DNA and the work that you've done to have impact. And it's not just about financial returns. You know, maybe you could make more money in a class A or a class C property, I don't know. But for you, it's really that heartbeat of, hey, let me help the working class make sure that they have good, clean, well-maintained housing and also not being taken advantage of as it relates to some of the fees, like the, you know, $25 example that you gave, making sure it's an equitable exchange. It's a great way to be thinking about servicing the clients that you service. One thing I want to dig into a little bit, John, is you talked about sometimes operators get themselves into trouble by not being appropriately capitalized for the project that they take on. So it sounds like that's maybe one of the common pitfalls. Can you talk about like, what is the common mistake that they've made there? Is it just that they underwrote it improperly or just that they didn't capitalize it? Like what's the common issue and what are some other common pitfalls that you've seen? Yeah, there there are definitely multiple ways you can come about that, right? So one is simply, I I would say there's two main buckets, right? One bucket is going to be cash flow, right? is the property cash flow in each month. And that take, that's a matter of looking at the current income, looking at the current expenses, projecting your future income, projecting your future expenses, and understanding how much cash you're gonna have at the end of the day. Some people make a mistake with that when they're underwriting. They miss certain things. They don't realize that, you know, just because you bought this property and, you know, expenses were say $50,000, but when you buy it, maybe the expenses won't be $50,000. You know, I I saw a deal someone sent me yesterday and they wanted me to review it for them. And I'm looking at it and the expense ratio is around 25%, right? The rule of thumb in the industry is around 50% typically, especially for like a a B minus C type property. So I'm like, well, there are clearly expenses that are missing, right? So if we go solely off of the current numbers, well, If the owner's not spending money because they're not fixing stuff, those numbers are incorrect, right? Right, I can make my repair and maintenance zero if I just decide I'm never fixing anything. That doesn't mean it's the property that you want, right? You want to, you probably want to fix those things because you want residents to stay there, right? You want them to pay rent. So there's a whole thing with underwriting where you can't just take the trailing 12 numbers and run with that. You have to really forecast what your operating budget's going to be. And it's not, I, I think people lean too heavily on whatever model or analyzer they use and they don't use enough true business planning. Like literally, what am I going to do? What's the issue? What do I need to solve it? What is this going to look like for me? Okay, if you have a property that is under lease, you're probably gonna have to spend more money on payroll, right? Because you're gonna need more bodies in there to fix whatever is not getting done to bring in a leasing agent and pay more commissions to get that thing leased up. And most models don't take that kind of thing into consideration. So cash flow is one thing. 
But on the flip side of that, you think about CapEx items. So people tend to miss big ticket items sometimes, particularly if you have an older property. Well, guess what? We're humans, right? When you were 20, you probably could recover from something like that, right? But you, you get up there into your late 30s and your 40s and old things tend to break down a little bit more than young things. So those, those newer <laughs> properties, you know, maybe in better condition, better shape, the roofs, the HVAC systems, the electrical, the plumbing, those things may all be in fine working condition, but you go and buy a 60 year old property, you know what? You don't need to fix some stuff here and there from time to time, right? That's just the nature of it. So if you're not accounting for that and planning for that upfront, then you can run into some issues. Yeah. Makes a ton of sense. So planning, super important, planning for the CapEx. And then also just from a cash flow perspective, I totally hear you. That underwriting is super important, not just looking at the T12, but thinking about, hey, how would I operate this asset? And maybe needing to build in a typical expense ratio, typical expenses. Last question, and then I'm going to hand it over to Dan to, to lead us through the, the lightning round here. Most of our investors are passive investors in, in real estate, but well, most of our listeners, I should say, are passive investors in real estate, just because that's, that's what we do as a, a business. Yeah. But I'm sure there are some folks that are interested in getting involved in active investing as well. So what advice would you give for either the active or the passive investor that's looking to get involved, really looking to make an impact, you know, in their communities and in the real estate industry, but they haven't done it before? Like, I, what, do you, what advice would you give for people to get started? I think the biggest advice I can give you is to align yourself with someone who can help you through this journey and treat it like a journey. You know, there's no graduation here. There's not a point where you reach a certain amount of deals and you get this piece of paper saying you are now the real estate expert, right? It's a journey. You know, we're all in this journey to mastery. You know, you mentioned my podcast. We've done over 600 episodes. I still learn something from every guest. So it's not about me feeling like, oh, we've, we've made it and we're done. I still have a coach, right? I still work with my, my coach. I was talking to him last week about a deal just to get his perspective on, you know, hey, like what, when would you refinance and would you exit? What are your thoughts here? So I think it's critical because if you are looking to be active and in particular, if you're looking to raise money from other investors, take it seriously. People work really hard for their money. You know, someone who is an accredited investor making $200,000 a year, investing $50,000 into your deal. Well, first of all, they make 200K, they're giving half that to the government. So they really make around 100K or so a year. They're gonna give half of that to you for an investment. That's six months of their life they're dedicating to a deal that you brought to them that you believe in, that they are trusting you to help them grow their portfolio, right? Take that seriously, you know? They, they put six months of their life into this deal you're doing is the way you should be thinking about it. So. Treat it with respect. Make sure you're doing everything you can to protect them, protect their investments, recognize the risk, and mitigate that risk on their behalf. The best way you can do that is to educate yourself, but also align yourself with somebody who can help navigate that process for you. Hire a coach, hire a consultant, invest passively with another group. Take those steps so you can learn as you earn, continue to grow, and put yourself in the best position moving forward. Wise words. Learn as you earn. I love that. Yeah, I just love your posture of like continuous learning in general. The fact that you, you know, say that you learn from every, every guest on your podcast, I think is super powerful and impactful. So Dan, uh, why don't you take us away? Sure, I will do that. Hey, before I do though, John, I just wanted to say kudos, the perspective on how you define value add investing. I think that's another nugget I'm coming away with today. I don't think I've heard anyone sort of describe it as like fundamentally thinking, how can I add value to the experience of the resident? You know, when we think of value add, I think a more traditional framework for how you think about that term is just, I bought it for 10, how can I make it worth 12, right? But I think taking the posture of how can I actually add value to the experience of the people that are here? And in the process, I'm probably gonna make it worth not 10, but, but 12, I think is a really unique approach. So thanks for that. Hey, so it's been really fun getting to know John, the real estate investor and advisor and mogul. But now I want to get to go get to know John, the person, a little bit. So uh, what would you say in your life is your biggest win? Ooh, biggest win. My biggest win is actually a, more of a loss. And I, I wrestled in high school and I sucked. That was terrible my freshman year. 
the record books show that I won four matches, but that was all because those people didn't show up or they didn't have a, anybody in my weight class. But I stuck to it. And at the end of my wrestling career, I finished with my name on the record books for most career wins. Wasn't at the top, but it was on the board. And I just, that built resiliency in me. And it's something that I still can rely on. You know, I think you have to have those moments in your life where you can remember who you are and give yourself the freedom to try to be better and try to fail. Because if you're not, if you're not willing to accept failure, you'll never soar to success. So I needed to be able to do that and refer back to those experiences to know that, Hey, just stick with it. You'll, you'll eventually win. Wow. That's a really neat story. Thanks for that. What's your favorite movie? Favorite, not best, right? You're saying favorite, not favorite. Th- Okay, so favorite is not best, right? I'm not saying this is the best movie by far, but my favorite movie is The Last Dragon. It's an amazing movie. It's a very gory production. It's a Bruce Lee type action movie from the 80s where this guy goes on a trek to become the last dragon or to actually to meet the last dragon and he ends up becoming the last dragon. But it's super cool pop culture, like references throughout. It's great, great movie. I'm sorry. I say great movie. I really enjoy this movie. It's my favorite movie. Please, no film critics. Watch that and judge me, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go watch it now. And Can I, I give I you a little say, context, though? Uh, so yes. I didn't know this until I got the 30th anniversary DVD. And it's actually brilliant because when I watched it, and I could watch the director's cut, it helped me understand why it's my favorite movie. So I knew it was my favorite movie. I didn't know why. And at that time when it came out, there were no like black superhero type movies. It just mm. didn't exist. And this was really the first time they took a character. Barry Gordy's behind Motel, right? So he took that and he made this film because he specifically wanted to highlight like this, this black superhero type character. Mm. And as a young kid, I resonated with that so much. And I never knew why, but that was the reason it connected with me. And I didn't know that until I watched the 30th anniversary DVD like, you know, seven years ago. And I was like, oh, that's probably why I love this movie. <laughs> That's a really beautiful thing, man. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I will. It's, it's on my radar now, so I'm going to go watch that. And I'll probably follow up with you and tell you that it is not the best movie I've ever seen, but I really enjoyed movie. it. So, <laughs> <laughs> What is your favorite food? So my favorite food is a food I haven't had in probably seven years, and it is uh, barbecue beef ribs. And wow. I, my grandmother made it as a child, and she had made the absolute best ribs. I mean, she would boil it first to get it soft and tender and then bake it twice and it would just melt in your mouth and it was delicious and I, I i don't eat it very often because i don't know anyone who can make it like she did she gave me the recipe before she passed away i think i attempted it once i failed and uh i said ah, you know what I'll, I'll try again and maybe at some point in life so maybe i'll, I'll try again this summer but that's my favorite yeah. food you should well you live in cincinnati right which is not I that do. far from kansas city so you could get some some barbecue just Hops but it's not the same. Barbecue I'm beef sure it's ribs not is not the, it's not the same. And it's got to be tender. It almost has to mm. be like a brisket, you know? So she made it almost where it's like a brisket on a, on a rib. So it's, <laughs> it's not easy to make. I bet. I bet. Well, let us know when you try again. Yeah. I might have to come out to Cincinnati to try it. What's a current growth edge for you? And by that, we mean what's the way that you're trying to improve personally or professionally? So you talked about, I think you talked about who, not how. And one of the things for me is realizing that there are things that we want to improve upon and there are people around me who can help. And just to be mindful of that, instead of racking my brain, trying to solve a challenge to just be mindful enough to step back and recognize that there are resources around me. So that's something that I try to do at least once a month is really step back and say, okay, hey, what am what am I facing? What's not growing? What's not working? Where are we not getting results? Okay, who do I know that can help me? And that's everything from, like I coach my son's like football team. And I happened to, one of my friends and investors was one of the head coaches of a team that went to the high school state championship just a couple of years ago. So I was like, why don't I just call him and ask him how he, what do you do? <laughs> so I sat down with him for two hours and he kind of laid out, Hey, here's our approach practice. Here's my install plan. So I'm like, okay, now I'm taking this guy who took his team to the state championship. I'm running that now for my second grade, my second grader. So, so. yeah, again, I, we see that thread in you of being a continuous learner and really respect that. I know 
the early days of Andrew and I growing Burgo, we, man, we had like no advisors, no help, no nothing. We just tried to do it all ourselves. And I think we probably would have avoided a lot of mistakes had we had your advice uh, back then. So I have great. to, I have to remind myself too, from time to time, right? Because you, you learn so much and then you grow and you scale and then it's like, oh, I know how to do this, but then you're not getting the results. And then you have to remind yourself like, oh, well, let me call such and such, right? And it's just, it's sometimes tough because it's not like it's a, it's not like it's something that's killing you, right? But it's something that like, again, one of my mentors is one of the biggest real estate investors in the country. And I don't want to bother him with my little, you know, what may be trivial to me, but the truth of the matter is I could call him and he could give me feedback like that and I could have it solved in a minute versus me spending hours and hours, if not days, trying to figure out how to do it by myself. So sometimes we just have to humble ourselves and ask for help. Love that. Other than the Multifamily Insights podcast, what is A plus content you're taking in these days? Books, podcasts, or anything? Um, I love Audible. And then there's another app that is uh, called Headway. Headway is basically an abridged version of Audible. So it's 15 minute books. They just summarize it. It's really, really short. I like that. And then if I really like something I hear on Headway, I can go and get the longer version on Audible. But that's great if you just want to get concepts and just rip through, you know, multiple concepts. I do that as far as my um, like pre-workout. I listen to one of those. I'm just kind of walking or warming up on the treadmill and then um, kind of get into my workout. So I, I love those two things just to help me with ideas and information and helps get me going. Very cool. And lastly, for folks who have listened to the show, who want to follow your story or maybe learn about investing with Kasman, how can folks find you? The easiest thing is to go to our website. We have some free resources there, including a sample deal package. So whether you are a passive investor and want to get added to our email list, just learn more about us and our deals, you can do that. Or if you're active and you're interested in, you know, putting together your own deals and maybe interested in coaching or being a part of our mastermind, you can join and gather all that information. So just go to kasmancapital.com. Awesome. John, thanks so much. I learned a ton. A uh, couple takeaways that I had. One, one, I would just really appreciate, as Dan mentioned, kind of how you think of impact, how you think of value add. You're adding value to the residents, to the communities. Super impactful stuff. And two, just the importance of education and learning, being a continuous learner. And you've really learned and zeroed in on this particular niche. And I think that's been incredibly impactful in how you're helping others through your podcast or through your education to identify their niche and to do, to really do what you've done. And also just really this concept of who, not how, aligning yourself with somebody that can really help direct you as opposed to figuring it out on your own, something that's really impactful for me. So thank you so much for being on this show, John. Thanks for, for coming along and sharing some of your insights with our, with our listeners. Guys, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure talking to you both and uh, really enjoyed our time today. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Real Returns podcast. We hope that you learned something new about how you can invest to make a lasting impact on those around you. Please be sure to subscribe to our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. Leave us a review and share about us on social media. We hope you will join us for our next episode, where we will be continuing the conversation around impactful real estate investing.